Hi, my name's Tanya Saad. I'm the author of um, a memoir called From the Feet Up. And um, yeah, it's about my story. Hi, I'm Vivian Saad Ibrahim. And I'm Tanya's sister. Hey, I'm Paula and uh, I'm part of this beautiful journey. I was actually the last to find out I carried the BRCA gene fault, but we, the three of us sat down together and, um, and first, at first um, we discovered that our family had a history of breast and ovarian cancer and that we had a gene fault in the family. Um, when you discover you, you're a carrier um, and that you're part of that part of the family tree, it really stops you in your tracks because it isn't something that you can see um, and it's not something you can get rid of overnight. Mm -hmm. So it really um, was the start of a journey. And, um, and yeah, that was, that, uh, that it was certainly something that um, made me stop and think about what I wanted in my life and where I was at. For me, it, was, um, for me, it wasn't uh, as big of a deal when I first found out I was 25. It wasn't going to affect me. Technically, it wasn't going to affect me until I was like 30. Yeah, and then I had to start thinking about it. So initially, I thought, okay, this is just the diagnosis amongst many that are probably yet to come in my life. Uh, but when I had a child and your mortality is uh, standing right there and looking at you in the face, you quickly um, come to terms with the fact that, uh, with the statistics associated with BRCA. And um, they weren't great. So, you, uh, so personally, I came to terms with it, maybe not on initial uh, diagnosis, but maybe like when I had a child and that was that was definitely um, confronting and uh, the anticipation of um, should I have the operation, should I not, should I wait. There's still questions I ask myself today, even post-operation. So it's, it's a process. I don't think you ever really reconcile yourself with, with having BRCA. For me, I didn't have the gene. So when we um, initially going for the um, genetic testing, I, was, I guess I, wasn't, I was young as well and I didn't really think much of it. I just thought, oh, what's this test mum and dad are sending us for? All right, we'll just go along. But then obviously we, um, we sort of became more aware of the um, seriousness of, you know, um, having the gene and what, what would sort of come of it if we did and so forth. Um, I was lucky enough not to have the gene and um, Unfortunately for my two sisters, they did, and that was very, very upsetting for me. Um, I felt a lot of guilt, but at the same time, yes, yeah, a lot of mixed feelings. I, I mm. had to sort of feel grateful as well, um, and because I guess that's one less, or one person down not having it. Um, mm. So I mean, the three of us having it is, you know, um, I guess again, even ri higher risk for my parents losing one of us, or you know, of our children even, you know, for filtering down to the generation, the following generation. So, But again, being a mum and as time's gone on, I've come to realise how um, my sisters have been inspiring to me going through this and realising just that this isn't just about the gene, it's, it is about a journey. And um, it is about sort of, you know, really um, being grateful for life and, and for everything that you have that comes with that. If you're a BRCA gene fault carrier, particularly if you're BRCA1, if you're a BRCA1 gene fault carrier, you have a spectacularly good chance of getting breast and ovarian cancer if you're a female. Um, and, and the statistics are uh, you've got an 80% chance of breast cancer over your lifetime and an up to 60% chance of ovarian cancer. Um, so what adds to um, a BRCA gene fault carrier's risk is their family history, um, amongst other things, but mainly your family history. So for us, um, we, um, my, of our closest family members, 17 out of the 20 members that carried the gene also had cancer, breast or ovarian cancer, that's female members. On top of that, two male members with the gene had prostate cancer. So that's 85%. So we had a so we had a really active gene fault in our family, which obviously raises the level of risk. And along with that, at really young ages, women as young as 21 with breast cancer, and um, women as young as you know 36 um, getting ovarian cancer with the gene. So we we didn't have a great family history. What it also means, though, along aside from ovarian and breast cancer, is that your survival rates. Um, decrease by 30% overnight just by discovering you have the, the BRCA gene fault. 
So it goes from, for the ordinary person, um, their chances of reaching the age of 70 or 84 per cent, um, but for BRCA gene fault carriers, it drops to 53 per cent. I no, think, I yeah, I think um, the knowledge is power argument has always been the one that I've, I've used. And I think, yeah, I'd have to say yes. I agree. Unwillingly, yes. Mm -hmm. I'd agree. Definitely. Yeah. So when we discovered um, that our family <laughs> had a hereditary gene fault, we hadn't heard of the gene. Um, everyone carries a, a copy of a, two cop a copy of the BRCA gene, but we didn't. We weren't aware that we had a gene fault in the family. We'd never heard of the gene fault. When we discovered we had we carried the gene fault, it was like um, rather than actually receiving report we, support, we were educating. We were having to educate oh, our GPs, <coughs> our family, our friends, and um, it's it's and there was controversy. Yeah, a lot of controversy because and criticism. About yeah, well, what did it really mean? Everyone's got gene faults. You know, how can we actually how, how do we know what other gene faults we have and don't have? And how do we really know the severity? How do they really know about these statistics and whether they're really real? Because there's so few of us. I think there's what 900 in Australia or something no, you say. No, there's more than that actually. Oh, okay. But anyway, so yeah, I think we didn't. Like, we were googling to the best of our like our typing ability and we couldn't find anything even on google like i mean there'd be a blog in the netherlands or something that may mention BRCA, but it was far and few between so i mean in terms of the level of support generally um it isn't public knowledge uh, sorry it wasn't, um, yeah. it still isn't a public knowledge um sorry the BRCA gene and its risks and what the BRCA gene is even after angelina jolie's um you know admission that she also carries the gene fault um, still hasn't translated to you know, um, general public knowledge. Cancer organisations across Australia um, focus on women who have cancer. Um, so the BRCA gene fault carriers are a, a little bit in limbo, have been a little bit in limbo over the past, you know, particularly for us over the past six years since mm. we've discovered we carry the gene. And really our only support network that really understands what we're going through could be either women who carry the, the BRCA gene fault or the hereditary cancer clinics that our, our family or we, we've been managed out of because they're the real conduit, they're the, um, they're the network, they, they know other people that have mm. BRCA, they know doctors we need to be referred to they can provide us advice they help us put a plan in place to manage it mm. because it's really about a game of statistics and a, and a, and a game of chance mm. when you discover you have the gene mm. so um, essentially you've got it you've got this, that support network and that's about it I, I I wrote a book because when I went through the, my Jack, went, oh, I'm still going through my BRCA journey, but when I, when I decided to undertake the preventative measures and at some point during my BRCA journey where I was weighing up how much is too much risk, I reali and the realisation that there was no public knowledge, I really wanted to do my part. So writing my story and incorporating my BRCA journey is my 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 what way of educating either. peers and also hopefully giving the next generation um, um, a better understanding of what you have to go through and what what decisions need to perhaps be considered um, and also just making sure that women in Australia, no matter whether they're in a country town or in a city, have access to the right information resources and often a book is the best way of doing that because some of those support networks and information, information resources aren't available unless you find something online. So yeah, that's, that's hopefully what um, I'd like to see happen with my book. When I found out that um, that I carried the BRCA gene fault. It was very difficult to talk to family about who does and doesn't carry the BRCA gene, let alone who has and hasn't been tested. Um, when I did, um, when family members found out about the book, um, a couple of, and the mastectomy, the preventative bilateral mastectomy reconstruction um, that I underwent, 
in 2012, a couple of family members uh, approached me and um, said to me, never heard of the BRCA gene, didn't know it existed in our family. How can we find out? So that was a, a really good positive mm -hmm. because even though, um, you know, even though we like to think that our families are connected, we really are, we are really aren't that connected when it comes to our medical history. Yeah. And family and friends, we all have family and friends that live across the world in different places. And there isn't a formal mechanism at the moment that um, ensures that all family members even know that there is a gene fault in our family, let alone want to be tested. Mm -hmm. So I think what's important, and we raised $10,000 yeah. last year to go towards the Prince of Wales Hospital Hereditary, Re Cancer, Hereditary Cancer, Cancer Clinic oh. that are doing some research on trying to find a more formal way of educating, <laughs> of and, educating and com you know, getting that communication network out to families so that they do know yeah. if it does exist and they do have the choice as to whether or not they want to be tested. Um, okay, well, the process is tedious. <laughs> It's um, confronting, it's conflictual. The process is not easy, definitely. I mean, um, I mean, for some people, they just, I think, I think youth, if you, if you made the decision when you're 18, you take risks when you're 18, you think, yep, I'm invincible. Um, and, and if I had found out when I was 18, I probably would have just removed the breast then and thought, yep, this is fine. But the older you get, I think you, the more you question um, your life and, and how you're going to contribute in life and I think making the decision um, was definitely um, very hard and the anticipation around making the decision like assessing the risks, mm -hmm. there's risks in the surgery um, and also assessing the byproduct, the aesthetic, aesthetical byproduct of you know having a bilateral mastectomy, um, having uh, the great mm. you know advancements in surgical technology mm. now, we both have kept our nipples, we've both kept our skin I mean we're we're the lucky ones essentially yeah. um, so we've aesthetically got a good outcome but um, it was there's a lot it's to good. consider and um, as a woman it's hard and enough. a mother yeah and a well. mother you know not being able to breastfeed my next child I had to assess that do I do I wait I can't I can't scan or I can't screen for the next year and then if I have baby I can't scream because I'm breastfeeding so that's three years of my life but what if I get breast and cancer? And do you, do, you, uh, do you undergo IVF to make sure that your yeah. child doesn't get carry the gene as well mm. or do you not worry and hope that the she or he will have. be the 50% that doesn't get the doesn't gene worry. as opposed to passing it on. Um, it's uh, also it's it's a, it's a difficult decision because when you discover you carry the BRCA gene fault, it affects every aspect of your life. Yeah. And at no point in time is there a moment where you go, I've got all the answers. Mm -hmm. This is the moment where it doesn't matter what happens tomorrow, this is the right time. Mm -hmm. So, and, and the other thing is no one can tell you when the right time is. Mm -hmm. So it's a decision that you really have to make. Very individual. That you know you've got to have to live with. Mm. And it is really a personal journey. And there are, as Paula said, there's so many things to consider because there's so many offsets. Mm. Um, you know, and for and each individual and in every demographic. In, yeah. You, know, you look at Tanya. Tanya's a, a, a proud gay woman who wants to have children yeah. but has had to remove both her or one of her ovary and both fallopian tubes because she's at an age where the risk is higher. Hi. Whereas, you know, and again, myself, do I take away the fallopian tubes now and then just go through IVF? But what if I, as I'm going through IVF, I get the ovarian cancer gene? You know, I've had to ask my husband, which one would you rather, another child? Or would, you know, and he's like, oh, I'd rather you, obviously. So there's like, there's all these confronting questions that you really need to ask yourself. It's, it'd be lovely just to sleep it all under the carpet. I'd much rather it that way. I think we as women need to see ourselves as subjects of our environment, not objects of our environment, that we can contribute something that's not objectifying ourselves or, or objectifying each other or men objectifying us. I think we need to celebrate our bodies, celebrate our intellect, celebrate all aspects of what we have to contribute and celebrate each other. I think mm. women don't celebrate each other as we're saying yeah, enough. Yes. Um, I think 
uh, men have a brotherhood, um, it's unspoken of, um, and I don't think that there's that complexity and, and layeredness in, in men's personalities as there obviously is in women's. Um, I think that's because we're more intelligent, but that's just... Mm. <laughs> but, um, and I think we need to celebrate each other and that empower each other um, rather than obviously... Um, judge and... Judge, yeah, judge and, and, and be, and, and be kinder to, each other. Be kinder yeah. to yeah. each other. Be kinder to each other. Be kind more of... More compassionate. Uh, yeah, particularly around these kind of health issues. Um, I think we need to be less and be more forgiving and, 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 and loving. Put forward my advice there is to really just um, yeah, be compassionate, love yourself and mind over matter, really. Yeah. <laughs> I would just say um, learn to find the natural order of your life and embrace what is and isn't meant for you um, and the, the happier you'll be if you do that. I like for women, I like to say to women, it's okay to overly sexualize and objectify ourselves and, and love that part of ourselves. I think that part's okay, but I'd also love for us to believe that we are subjects. We can, you know, we can act. We're not just being acted upon. We can act, we can take action. I mean... Um, the feet up. <laughs> it's, a, it's a novel perspective about discovering a person's identity from the feet up rather than the head down. Boys, take note. <laughs> it's much more discreet. Um, my book really does um, examine what it means to be a woman, from a, be it a, a, an Arab woman in a country town, a gay woman, um, a rack of gene fault carrier. Um, and it's, it's really about embracing who we are and rather than what we want. Mm. And, um, and I hope you really enjoy reading it.